I'm going to kick things off. So Howard, um, thank you again for joining us here. I um, wanted to first ask you about your background um, as an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Um, you know, that's your background by trade, but what sparked your interest in the field of longevity? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'm about 60. Uh, and in a few months, I've been a runner, cyclist, basketball player, and uh, tournament level tennis player since I was young. Um, my medical training uh, stole uh, a lot of my free time early on, uh, then had first kid, um, I managed that and still remained active. Second child knocked me down. So uh, I started to gain a little weight. Uh, one day I had some stomach pain. Uh, saw a radiologist friend uh, close by. He threw me on an ultrasound table, scanned my, be my belly, said, good news, no gallstones, just see a little fat in the liver. Now, this was many years ago. We didn't know what fatty liver was or the implications of it. Um, so I started reading. And the more I read, uh, the more I didn't like it. Uh, and that just led me down various rabbit holes into heart disease, insulin resistance. Uh, it wasn't termed NAF LD at that point. And what the implications of, of fatty liver may or may not be. So uh, in order for me to learn more, I tend to write. Uh, I have a very busy, active website. So I started to uh, collect what I learned uh, on these various topics and I wrote about them. They became just as popular as my orthopedic surgery posts. I had a bunch of people reach out and ask me to write a book. Uh, boom came the pandemic. I had a little free time. Uh, so there came Longevity Simplified where I tried to boil this down so people could understand. Uh, okay. Um, and so for your practice now, you're still um, operating on patients. You're still um, in that, um, you know, treatment care. Or have you incorporated more preventative longevity medicine um, yeah. practices into that care? So our joints and tendon and, and the tissues there uh, are no different than your eyes, your heart, your kidneys, your pancreas with respect to the downstream effects of poor metabolic health. So osteoarthritis, rotator cuff tears, Achilles tears, quadricep tendon tears are more common in people with poor metabolic health, hypercholesterolemia, high uric acid, um, and metabolic syndrome um, because of the chronic inflammatory burden and because of the crystals that can deposit uh, into our tissues and our joints. So when this became obvious to me, I started to incorporate this into my conversations with people because it's clear that a significant percentage of the people that I'm seeing in the office have metabolic syndrome or poor metabolic health, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, et cetera. So we can control people's pain if we can improve their metabolic health. So you have people with moderate discomfort. Um, they're, not, they're not miserable, so we don't need to consider surgery. You have time to work on their health and well-being, and that's going to improve their knee pain or shoulder pain. Um, obviously, we can't cure a rotator cuff tear with it, um, but that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because if we can get people around your age uh, to start thinking uh, about their metabolic health, then uh, the area under the curve or the time that you're suffering from these issues is going to decrease. So the future ramifications are going to be less frequent. Yeah, that's, um, you know, on paper, they may seem seemingly unrelated um, to those, you know, untrained, but it's, um, you know, every body system can impact the other and being able to run an integrative um, you know, practice in, 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 in an integrative way like that is, um, you know, super interesting and definitely seems like we're, um, the future of a lot of, um, healthcare is going. So, 
Um, to kind of loop things back to your book, um, you really emphasize, um, throughout the book, you emphasize the six evidence-based strategies um, to increase your longevity. And you've touched on a couple of them already, um, including creating a calorie deficit, um, staying lean, um, getting sleep, eat real food, move often throughout the day, push and pull heavy things, um, and have a sense of purpose. Um, from this list, is there any one area that you recommend um, prioritizing or having people start with first? Um, they're both, they're all kind of broad um, and seem seem relatively, you know, straightforward to do, but how how do you go about prioritizing and implementing um, what, what would be most impactful? Yeah, so that's really tough to answer yeah. because we really don't have one single big lever. Um, a lot of us might say exercise, others might say diet, but, I, and a lot of people overcomplicate this. So I'll have people with borderline health issues. Um, they want to get in shape and they're targeting one thing, or they may even go farther down the rabbit hole and take, and take metformin or rapamycin. So they're going down this metabolic path, pathway, but they're not sleeping well. Or they're drinking themselves to sleep. Um, they're eating, you know, half a box of Cheetos uh, prior to uh, bedtime. Uh, they're not trying to prioritize their social life. Um, I mentioned friends too, because it turns out that loneliness, um, especially as we age in middle age, uh, is as big a problem, if not more, than cardiovascular disease and other diseases that we associate with poor health. Um, so I, I, I find it really hard. If you're exercising, if you're running, uh, and you're not getting seven to eight hours of sleep a day, you're not maximizing your benefit. You're not training to the level that you could. Uh, you're not recovering as well. Um, if you're running every day, five days a week, and you're not feeding uh, the burn, you're, uh, if you're not feeding yourself appropriately, um, you're going to suffer the downstream consequences. You know, you're still at risk for developing a heart attack, heart disease, et cetera. Um, so I really try and work with people to pull all these levers. Um, but as I discuss in the book, um, and I'm going to touch on this a lot. I really want people to try and avoid overcomplicating this. So many people, most people face it, don't like to exercise. They don't like to sweat. They don't like the pain. Uh, they don't like the, the, the discomfort. And I do stutter, so forgive me, but I'll catch up. We can't forget the fact that human all-cause mortality decreases dramatically with six to 8,000 steps a day. So for people who hate exercising, walking in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, I'd rather you three small walks than one big one, um, works just as well as getting out there and running. Um, you don't have to become a vegetarian. You don't have to become a vegan. You can eat meat. You stay on the outside of the supermarket. You eat real food. You eat some fruits and vegetables. Um, you eat some meat and high quality protein. Uh, and you got your diet tied down. Um, we tend to prioritize exercise, right? We'll schedule it. Um, we can't wait to, to get home and do it. Or we wake up in the morning when we take off. But one thing we tend not to prioritize is sleep. Um, we'll sit there and play with our iPad or watch a TV show and we'll just wait until we pass out. Um, but if you understood that there, there's no bodily process, physiological process in our body that is not detrimentally affected by a lack of sleep, none. The cause of um, uh, the incidence of heart attacks uh, goes up if you, if you sleep poorly. Insulin resistance is higher the morning after a night of poor sleep. We know that your cognitive function is diminished. Um, so we need to prioritize our sleep and to improve our circadian clock, which we've all heard about, right? It's great to get sunlight in the morning, no sunglasses, four or five minutes is enough to help to set the clock. 
that clock needs us to go to sleep around the same time and wake up the same time. We do better with uh, that pattern. So, you know, I try and prioritize being in bed, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, then to sleep a little while later, uh, knowing that I'm going to wake up at 5, 5.30, regardless of what time I go to sleep. Um, so I can't say that one lever is any more important than the other. I happen to be in the exercise camp if you have to choose one, um, but uh, you can't discount the others. Yeah, it also seems like you've touched on being able to identify what part of that person's current life may be impacted like the most so far. So if you're not exercising at all, adding in exercise, you know, starting there versus if you're already having like whole grains or something, um, being able to figure out maybe what's missing the most from um, your current wellness and, and starting starting there. Right. Most people are really good at prioritizing one of these levers. So mm -hmm. they're paying really close attention to their diet or really close attention to their exercise or sleep. Um, it's not that more difficult to start to prioritize the others um, because they, they all help improve our metabolic health, fitness, health span, and hopefully longevity. Exactly. Um, so kind of going into, um, you know, more of your, your specialty in these, these levers um, as exercise. So as you said, many people are um, hesitant or don't know where to start when it comes to implementing a new type of exercise, whether that's like aerobic or resistance training. Um, do you have any um, tips on how to start scheduling or planning um, that type of like fitness routine? Yeah. So uh, again, not to overcomplicate things for people who are not into uh, sweating and discomfort, um, walking is fine. It really works. Um, you should be walking often. You should be parking as far as you can from the entrance to your building or to the supermarket or the mall. Um, you should be leaving the office for a half an hour at lunchtime. Uh, you can walk around the block of your house uh, shortly before or after dinner. Um, and our dogs would love the company to go outside too. Um, for others, you know, it's going to depend on where you are in your life. Um, if you're a runner, then you should enjoy running. You know, you're probably running too fast. You're probably running too hard. Um, and paying attention more to low heart rate or zone two training is going to work uh, better for you with regards to your metabolic health uh, and diminish the recovery burden, inflammatory burden, and the risk of injuries too. Those of us, there are, there are many of us, and me, me included, who like those hard, hard days. So I'm doing three or four easier, longest runs a week, and then I'll have my hill repeat day, my sprint day, or my track workout day, because, because I'll enjoy that. You don't need to go out you know, to your local weight shop you know, and buy $2,000 worth of weights. You, know, you could have a few kettlebells around, a few exercise straps. Um, and if you can do a few complex movements, um, such as, such as pull-ups, uh, push-ups, air squats, body weight work, um, you're doing enough. Um, obviously, there are benefits to adding resistance in. Uh, and once air squats and body weight work becomes a little too easy, then you progress. Um, I often ask folks over 40 to concentrate more on your legs than on your arms. There's a process known as sarcopenia. That's age-related pre-programmed -pro -pre muscle loss. Um, beginning around the age of 40, sometimes late 30s, we start to lose close to 1% of our muscle mass per year that starts to accelerate um, when we get into our 60s. It, acceler it accelerates dramatically in, in our 70s. Um, we, lose, we lose muscle tissue and we lose satellite cells. Um, those are the cells that regenerate muscle. Um, and this becomes a big problem. 
uh, because one of the goals of living longer is not just becoming 120 uh, or 110, but it's being able to do things, right? Do you want to get your your 40 pound suitcase up into the luggage carrier? Uh, do you want to be able to bring mulch uh, and seed to your backyard? Do you want to bring the groceries in? Well, you're not going to be able to do that unless you train those activities. Uh, for example, I have three sandbags uh, here at home in the basement, 25, 50, 75. So I'm lifting them, lugging them, carrying them, throwing them around. Uh, so I can plan to continue to do the exercises and activities that I'm doing outside now when I'm into my 70s, 80s, and beyond. So keeping our legs strong is super important because we want to be independent when we're older. We don't want to be hunched over and on a walker. Um, we don't want to struggle to get out of a chair. Uh, you should be able to get off the ground with one hand at most as support, hopefully with no hands. Um, you shouldn't have to shove yourself up out of a chair. You shouldn't have to fall back in, into the chair. Um, so this is why we need to train our legs as we get older more than our arms. Uh, your wife or, or husband may like your guns or partner may, may like your arms, but big legs mat matter more. Yeah, that functional side of, you know, being able to, to do those activities of daily living um, and beyond for as long as um, you possibly can, um, can really help improve quality of life um, at, during those later years. Um, and kind of going off of that, the, the lower body, um, a lot of people as they age do experience um, some of that joint pain and that osteoarthritis, which might make um, exercising or doing something like squats, um, you know, somewhat uncomfortable. Um, do you have any, um, you know, is this um, preventable and should people with arthritis or osteoarthritis um, still exercise? exercise or how, how do you go about managing that? Great question. Um, long answer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I We're deal ready. with this every day in my office, um, many times over. Most of you out there think that osteoarthritis has a mechanical etiology or cause and that your activities are wearing out your joint. You also mistakenly believe that resting and not doing things is going to allow that arthritis to progress at a slower pace. Well, that's wrong. And unfortunately, even some, uh, a lot of my colleagues, especially in the primary care space, don't understand this as well. So I have to counter th this advice on a daily basis in my office. Osteoarthritis is a biological issue. Sure, you can fall off something, you could break your knee, and you're going to suffer the consequences of that. That's not what I'm talking about. For the majority of you, um, this is a biological issue. Uh, our, our cartilage, um, again, just like our kidneys, heart, liver, and pancreas, requires certain nutrients in our joint fluid in order to be adequately nourished, to uh, maintain the integrity of the cartilage, to reproduce, et cetera. If we have poor metabolic health, we have increase in various cytokines and interleukins that are pro-inflammatory, and that will affect the nourishment of the cartilage and affect the rate at which the cartilage degrades. Furthermore, with poor metabolic health, um, and dysfunction, we see increased markers in our body that trend with the degradation of cartilage. And after activity, or when we get up and walk or move or run, those markers of degradation decrease dramatically. Our body starts to, to, to manufacture anti-inflammatory interleukins and cytokines when we're moving. Um, so this is why you're stiff in the morning because, or if you've sat around for two hours in a row, uh, 
because you've built up these inflammatory mediators um, and it's affecting all the lining uh, tissues of the knee, like the synovium, it's affecting the cartilage. Uh, and so the, the joint is cranky. And that's why after you're up and you're walking for a little while, you feel better. So everyone, especially runners, I treat a lot of runners uh, because I'm a runner. Um, and a lot of them are told either by a therapist or their physician or by their friends <laughs> that you really shouldn't run anymore uh, because of your arthritis, you're gonna make it worse. It's not true. By and large, osteoarthritis is less prevalent in runners than non-runners. They've done studies where they've compared what happens to people with arthritis if you break them apart into groups that run and don't run. Now, they might be running a 12 minute mile, but they're running. It turns out the sedentary group is more commonly going to end with a knee replacement than the active group. If you strength train, you better support your joints. Um, and there's less strain on the joints if those muscles are capable of ele elevating you instead of having to rock yourself forward and back. So it diminishes the stresses that, that, that are on your joints. Strength training, like running, is not going to worsen your arthritis, um, plain and simple. And People who do sit there and say, I'm going to rest because um, I don't want to make my arthritis worse. You're throwing your entire health under the bus under a false assumption that your, your arthritis is not going to get worse. Now, of course, some of you are going to have enough arthritis or pain that you can't run. Okay, but that doesn't mean you can't cycle or swim or do yoga or weight train. Most people, when we start weight training, have some pain. Uh, again, I'm, I'm close to 60. I don't think I've had a painless workout in 15 and 10 years. Um, and with long runs over eight to 10 miles, <laughs> I certainly know it when I get home. But I've imaged my joints. They're not degenerating. I don't have any significant arth arthritis. Uh, and so I push on because I have no issues with, with climbing stairs. I can get up in, in independently from the floor without using my hands. And I want to continue doing so. So if you have been told you have mild arthritis, don't worry about it. You can stay active. You should stay active. Your arthritis will likely advance uh, less significantly than it will if you become sedentary. You're not protecting your joints by being inactive um, and you're throwing your health under the bus if you do so as well. Yeah, um, something you, you touched on that I think to me was one of the most um, interesting part of, parts of your books was for um, you know, continuing to exercise for um, you know, that arthritis, but also that rarely is stopping exercise even during rest and recovery like fully necessary and going back to like the individuality of that of like what does your rest and recovery look like for someone who runs you know 30 miles a week versus a recreational you know runs eight miles or so you know that recovery day is going to look different and that recovery day doesn't have to mean necessarily absolutely no activity um right. and, and utilizing that active recovery um is you know important for um, you know, the joints and also a lot of time for those people's mental health of still staying active and, and, and stimulated um, as well. So I think that was, um, you briefly touched on it in that long answer, but. Um, no, you're absolutely correct. Um, people, you, you, your need to recover uh, or rest and they're different things um, will depend on your age, will depend on what your uh, load is, how much you've been running or cycling or training. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I strongly recommend that everyone monitor their HRV uh, because your heart rate variability is going to give you uh, dramatic in insight into your internal stress. 
And not only the stress due to your cycling, riding, or running, but it's going to account for the stress because of your family, your work, your lack of sleep, you drank too much, et cetera. So it really helps to guide your activities and what you can do that day. Um, so my recovery needs have, have increased over time, but a recovery day for me is a three mile hike with a dog. You know, it's not, it's not sitting on the couch and watching a, uh, a second movie. Um, and on rare occasion, I'm going to rest too, you know, but that's very infrequent. Uh, unless my, unless my HRV is in the red zone and it's really telling me don't do much. Uh, but a yellow flag on the HRV, or if you wake up and you just don't feel it, uh, then don't push it. You, there's no reason to hurt yourself, uh, but walk, do something, or just get on a bike and spin with little resistance. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> okay. So Moving a little bit away from exercise now, I'm going to that um, more diet pillar. Um, in terms of diet, what would be your top three um, measures, actions, or suggestions um, for what to eat for targeting longevity? Yeah, so uh, again, I, I like to stay out of, if, if any of you are on Twitter and you've seen the diet conversations, it's very clear that you need to stay far away. Um, I'm in the, I'm very much in the real food camp, shopping in the outer parts of the supermarket. If you love meat, eat meat, but include a lot of vegetables on your plate. Um, if you like fruit, great. There's nothing wrong with the sugar in fruit, especially if you're non-diabetic. Uh, I'm, there's nothing wrong with carbs. Uh, the issue is not fats or carbs, it's the combination and the totality of the calories that we eat. Um, Kevin Hall, uh, Herman Ponzer, and, and lots of great respectable authors have written extensively on this. You can gain weight, uh, I'm sorry, lose weight on a high carb diet. You can lose weight on a high fat diet. Uh, if keto works for you, fantastic. That's great. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm sorry, try something else. Um, but so I really like everything else. I don't want people to overcomplicate their diet. Um, we know what the results of ultra processed foods are on, on our body. And there's been a bunch of papers out, even one the other day in JAMA showing that cognitive function is significantly diminished in people who eat more ultra processed foods. We know that in insulin resistance is higher. They've washed the fiber out of the foods that are processed. And we know how important that fiber is. Um, it's super important because of these short chain fatty acids that the bacteria in your gut that eat the fiber will make. Uh, our body then absorbs those short chain fatty acids and they have a myriad of significant uh, impact and effects on our body from our brain to every end organ. Um, so you can't overstate that. So if you do like meat, get some vegetables in there as well. You have to up your fiber content. Yeah, always, um, always the fiber as well as um, for, <laughs> for that gut health and those uh, metabolites, as well as metabolic health and, you know, balancing, being able to balance uh, that blood sugar um, as well. And, you know, one thing to touch on, I'm sorry to interrupt oh. you, Molly, uh, protein, right? Um, mm -hmm. Controversial space. Um, you know, if you, if you listen to Brad Schoenfeld, um, Stewart at a McMaster University and a bunch of other highly experienced researchers, we need enough protein to fuel our metabolic needs. If you're exercising, if you're working out, you need the building blocks to manufacture new muscle protein. Does that mean 50 milligrams with, uh, I'm sorry, 50 grams with each meal? No. Um, you know, it can be 25 to 30. You have people saying that you won't make new protein if you don't get 45. That's controversial. You have people saying that you'll live longer if you eat only five grams, uh, you know, protein a day. 
that's highly controversial as well. Um, I don't want to break muscle down and not have the ability to, to rebuild it. Again, I, I focus more on the uh, pleasure of the years that I have left and in my terminal decade than I do in living to 120. You know, if I have to sacrifice any of my abilities, I want to maintain a VO2 max over 50 as long and as far as I can go. Um, so I'm going to prioritize my diet and needs uh, to enhance my muscle recovery, enhance my muscle mass and my recovery from my exercise. Yeah, we've um, he heard a lot about um, possibly the benefits of a lower protein diet for longevity or people who have been restricting their protein intake um, for longevity. So um, I'm uh, pleased that you were able to touch on that. Um, usually general recommendations uh, for protein range from about the 0.8 um, grams per kilogram of body weight per day to maybe about um, 1.2 or higher, depending on, um, you know, activity, age, um, you know, other health status, but um, kind of that range right now, right there. Is that what you would still tend to Yes, uh, and, and I'd like you to space it out throughout the day. Um, unless you get a good protein meal at night, uh, you're gonna be catabolic uh, by the time you wake up in the morning. Um, so I really try to get a, a good protein dose with uh, dinner. And, and when I wake up, I tend to have a you know big veggie something pro protein uh, smoothie uh, in the morning uh, right after my run. Okay. Um, so in terms of kind of measuring or tracking, um, the aging process, what would you consider are some of the best biomarkers, um, for aging? And are there any that you recommend tracking that aren't typically included in, um, like a yearly physical? That yeah. People get? yeah. So your, your, the possibility of living longer and certainly again, living better is going to, to depend on your on your overall fitness and well-being um, and that boils down to you know the root cause of a lot of the chronic diseases uh, that are going to rob years from us is poor metabolic health and poor mitochondrial function and poor energy processing that's the you know, reason why dementia is so common that's why we call dementia now type 3 diabetes in some circles I'm not a believer in biological clocks, you know, or methylation. There's, uh, yeah, there's, you know, there are some people who really push it and others saying not so relevant. So that's undecided. Um, so I monitor markers of, of metabolic health. I really don't want to overcomplicate it. Uh, I monitor uric acid levels because it's far more than just a uh, mindless byproduct of, of, uh, of pure metabolism. Uh, the only issue with uric acid is not gout. Uh, it does have effects on our kidneys and pancreas uh, and other downstream issues. Um, uh, your LDL levels matter. Um, your ApoB levels matter. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're in the camp that doesn't believe that. I just think you're rolling the biggest dice of your life. Uh, and that's just a bet I don't want to be on the wrong side of. Um, so, and if you like keto and it works for you and you've lost weight and you feel great, that's fine. You can participate in a keto or a high fat diet that doesn't raise your cholesterol. You change the types of fats you eat. God forbid you could take a statin, zetia, fiber intake, and others to drive that cholesterol down. Um, I investigate, you know, for the presence of insulin resistance um, and uh, liver enzymes. Uh, sadly, the incidence of NAFLD or you know, fatty liver is off the charts these days. It's the most mm -hmm. common reason for liver transplants. Um, it's a very toxic situation uh, that uh, you need to be very aggressive in terms of managing. So, you know, this 
conversation is relevant <laughs> to people if they're not on antihypertensives, not on a statin, um, not on aspirin for heart disease. Uh, so if you've aligned everything else and you want to dive deeper, fine. You know, if you exercise a ton and you're getting 40 miles, you know, a week under your belt, then you start to measure uh, ferritin and, and other issues um, and other biomarkers. Uh, but I don't push that far in people because I don't have to, because until we've done the basic work, until we've, we've corrected your metabolic health, have you sleeping uh, or trying to at least seven hours a day, have you eating well? Uh, and exercising, then we don't need to go any further because we know what the potential impact on these, uh, this chronic disease burden is going to be. Um, yeah, super um, interesting, especially leading with that, that, that metabolic approach, which you know bleeds into, as you said, um, almost every other aspect of health first. So um, we've had a question in the chat and um, one that came up a lot in prior submissions is, you know, you said it multiple times, um, really, you know, you personally taking a really simplified um, approach to um, longevity and um, However, there's, of course, um, emerging research coming out every day in a lot of fields or a lot of um, topics or foods or supplements um, related to, um, you know, living longer, um, extending your life. And um, we have a lot of people here interested in um, new medications for longevity, such as metformin, or I always say it wrong, rap rapamycin. Rapamycin. Um, and do you have any, um, you know, what's your advice for people who clo closely follow, you know, the newest, latest and greatest, um, research, um, and how to, you know, determine, um, fad from, you know, what's going to work. Right. Um, so metformin was the first one to come around. Uh, it's a drug initially given for, you know, for pre-diabetics and some, uh, minor type to diabetics um, and a lot of folks in the uh, in the longevity space uh, started to take it. Uh, then came the papers showing that it uh, affects on mitochondria. I mean, it really is a mitochondrial poison on some level. So there's a consequence to taking it. Um, so if you're uh, an endurance athlete, uh, cyclist, runner, you have to weigh the pros and cons and the pros don't look all that significant right now. You know, if you've pulled your levers, you're sleeping well, you're exercising and you're nailing, you know, a few hundred miles a week on a bike or, or 40, 50 miles running, uh, which is a lot, you're doing fine. And I don't see any benefit to, to metformin in that space. Um, a lot of people sadly uh, have, have insulin resistance. Um, the world is highly focused on precise numbers, right? When are you a type two diabetic? I can't tell you how often in my office I'm meeting with someone and you know, what, what, what issues do you have is the question. And they'll say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm pre-diabetic or I'm not quite diabetic, which means that your A1C is up. Um, and if your A1C is over five, four or five, five, you're on your way to diet to type to diabetes, you know, do you want to wait until it goes over six five, uh, or do you want to to do something about it? So that should be a wake up call. Uh, you don't want to to walk around with with pre diabetes for too long um, before you start acting on it. In those situations, I find that metformin is very useful. Um, again, not as the only lever, <laughs> but it it's a good at at adjuvant. Um, rabamycin. Um, I've wrestled with the idea of trying it for years now. Okay. Um, I haven't pulled the trigger on it. Uh, I know a lot of people who are taking it. Um, I know of a lot of people who are taking it. The data uh, is 
good uh, right now. Uh, there are studies to support its use. Um, there's not concrete evidence and worse, we don't know the dosing. We don't know how much to take or how often to take it. Uh, and the numbers are, they vary dramatically. So I do think there's promise in rapamycin. Um, and I realize that my clock is ticking by as I wait for this data. But, you know, as a physician, you're uh, very much aware of the side effects and potential complications of things that were deemed safe uh, for a long time. Uh, and we, uh, yeah, so I, I'm not going down that path as yet. Um, yeah, and even with these, um, you know, medications, there's, um, you know, prescription only. So um, have you noticed that more people are coming in and asking about these medications or um, is it something that even physicians are now taking the lead on um, prescribing to patients. Yeah, no. So <laughs> maybe just, just trying to pick your brain. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. So, so maybe met metformin. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's used more often, but not enough. Um, not rapamycin. You need to find a longevity doc. Uh, but again, the dose and frequency uh, are just uncertain right now. Yeah. Um, I get a lot of asks for uh, for the GLP-1 medications, for Ozempic, Singlutide, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and I, I try to, some people need it, some people don't. I get asked to prescribe it for someone who wears a size four and they want to fit into a size three for the weekend. Uh, party. Yeah, you, they're not getting it. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, you know, medications, there's always the, the time and place and indicators. Um, but as you're saying, safety protocols and um, side effects and um, are all need to be under consideration when prescribing and starting to take a medication. Um, sometimes still think that there's a, an idea around, oh, a pill can can fix my problem. And what's a, you know, maybe some people being nervous about taking a pill for um, cholesterol, but being willing to take something for longevity. Um, it's a, a interesting, um, you know, mindset and, and dichotomy there. Again, I think that, I think that rapamycin is as close as we've ever been. Um, and I know, uh, I see a question here, you know, about David Sinclair and yes, he did publish a protocol on his book. Uh, you know, Peter Tia has a different one and I know two, two aging docs in my area and they both have very, very different protocols. So no one really knows the numbers or frequency yet. Um, and then moving away from medications, um, in terms of supplements, is there any, um, ones that are, um, that you find that, uh, worth it for healthy aging and longevity? Creatine. Creatine. Cre I'm a big, big fan of creatine. Um, if you're not getting enough fiber, I'm a big fan of psyllium husk and a smoothie or something else, um, to, to boost your fiber. If your cholesterol is a little high, but not too high, uh, then fiber is gonna work for you, you know, without the need for a Zetia or a statin. Um, yeah, I take magnesium too, because a lot of our foods are washed of a lot of key minerals. Uh, there's actually a fair amount of research that shows that you know a daily multivitamin might help. Um, so I do that as well. Uh, but other than that, um, I, I don't take a, a significant, significant number of supplements and I take about five grams of creatine a day. Okay. Um, and then kind of wrapping up here, um, we would love to know, um, what's next for you in terms of, um, writing your practice, um, anything excited that you're excited about? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm already at work on, on version two 
of longevity simplified, uh, adding in a few other chapters uh, and elaborating on things that I've been asked uh, through Twitter and other spaces, uh, writing some other books as well. Uh, I have a few courses that will come out soon. Uh, and that's about it. You know, I'm again, yeah, I'm nearing the you know, twilight of my career as a surgeon. Uh, I keep practicing predominantly because I like it. Uh, and I like helping people and seeing you in the office. It's just fun to have conversations in person. Uh, but at but at some point, you know, I want to spend more time with uh, wife. Uh, my kids, when they visit, uh, I want to get out on the trail more. Uh, I'm jealous of all my triathlon friends and the fact that they can put 40 hours a week into training that I can't right now. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Awesome. Um, do you have any last minute words for us? Yeah. yeah, you know, obviously the key message of the day was don't overcomplicate things. Um, and if you're going to take your health seriously, don't go down one path too far before you bring the other paths back to the same level. So don't go down the exercise path to 30 hours a week. If you're not sleeping, eating well, get out with your friends. Um, what way, what, what's going to pull you up to get out of bed in the morning? You know, you don't want to drag out. You want to be excited. Uh, something has to drive you. Um, and pull, pull as many levers at the same time as you can. If you fix those and then you want to go down the rabbit holes of, you know, of other things, fantastic. Um, just do so cautiously. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Howard, for taking the time out of your day to um, talk a little bit about um, the book and all the research that um, you put into it. Um, as a reminder, um, Howard's book is called Longevity Simplified. Um, it is available on Amazon and it is a really great um, read that you'll fly through. So, um, Thank you so much, Howard, and for everyone for joining us today. Um, we will be sending out um, the recording of this um, in an email in the next week or so. So be on the lookout for that and um, appreciate, um, appreciate everyone being here. Thanks, Molly. Awesome. Um, have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye.